Welcome back everyone, I'm Casey Duckering and this is Lecture 5b, Global Circuit Optimizations. Okay, so previously we discussed optimizations to make the gates of your decomposed circuit run as efficiently as possible on the specific hardware without changing the structure of the circuit. Um, so today we'll discuss optimizations that consider gates across the entire decomposed circuit and the structure of it, and methods that use this big picture perspective to rearrange, cancel, and simplify um, patterns of gates, usually with the goal of minimizing gate count. Um, because this is an easy to measure and effective metric, um, but you can also consider um, parallelism of gates, um, short, how long your circuit runs for, or reducing um, crosstalk or specific gates running in parallel, um, reducing the, num the gates that run in parallel. Um, all right, these are some additional metrics that can be considered, but we'll mostly focus on gate count as that's um, simpler and relatively effective. Um, so some methods we'll discuss today um, include resynthesis of small blocks of gates within the larger circuit. Um, and this is good for methods that are expensive on the number of qubits they're looking at, So, but we can still get some gain by looking at small blocks of the circuit. Um, we'll also look at gate commutation where you move individual gates around based on rules, potentially adding extra gates as you um, switch the order with other gates. And this is with the goal of canceling some gates with other gates by moving them next to each other. Um, a third method we'll look at is pattern matching where you have a list of known identities of this group of gates equals this group of gates um, this sequence of gates equals this sequence of gates. Um, therefore, you can find and replace um, this sequence with this sequence to potentially reduce your gate count. And then finally, we'll look at um, a newer method, the ZX calculus, where you actually transform your circuit into a different representation to optimize and then transform it back into a circuit representation. Okay. So first we'll talk about optimization by blocks of gates. So um, we're often given large decomposed circuits such as this with many CNOT gates and um, a variety of single qubit gates. And the optimizer is told to try to find a way to run this same circuit, but with fewer gates. Um, often fewer CNOT gates because CNOT gates um, are more error prone or expensive to run on systems. So um, when you optimize by blocks, you have to find blocks of gates that are on a limited number of qubits. So if your limit is two qubits, you might find blocks like these on the top and in the middle here, where this top is the first two qubits has this sequence of gates on it. And notice how we can actually rearrange this T gate um, is actually on a separate qubit from this C0 gate, so we can include this in this block. And so this is as many gates as we can fit on these two qubits without any other gates interacting with other qubits. And then down here, you can see that a block can doesn't have to be between neighboring qubits in the diagram, um, because the diagram is just an arbitrary represent ordering of these qubits. So they can, as long as there's no gates on this middle line, this is a block on two qubits. And we can also look at bigger blocks, like this is a block on three qubits, with this top, the second one, and this further down qubit here, with these many gates. So there's many methods that can take blocks of gates and find a replacement for them that has fewer gates. So um, one that we saw before is KAK. Um, so KAK is nice because it always finds a sequence of um, three C0 gates or fewer that replace any sequence of two qubit gates. Uh, and sometimes, such as in this case, it can find um, just a version with just one in special cases. Um, but KAK um, doesn't work well on more qubits or is not easy to apply at least, or we don't know how to apply it yet. So we have to use other methods for larger subblocks. So for a three qubit subblock like this, um, we would 
multiply all these gates, the matrices of all these gates together, get some big unitary gate here, and then apply some other method to decompose it into um, smaller gates. So I won't talk about all these methods. There's a variety of research on this, um, but it boils down to, um, well, the other thing is um, there are, opti there are um, arbitrary synthesis methods that can take any unitary and, synth and synthesize it as um, many exponential in the number of qubits gates. Um, but these aren't very useful for optimization because it ends up usually being more gates than you started with. Um, and there's really not many methods that can um, synthesize an arbitrary unitary into um, the optimal number of gates for that unitary. Um, so another method that um, has been proposed recently is this aggregated pulse instructions where you basically treat um, this three qubit or larger unitary as a single um, gate that you can execute in hardware. So normally you would execute each of the gates that made this sub-circuit up one at a time and in the pulse representation that we saw before um, you would have this sequence corresponds to a, say an X gate, this sequence corresponds to a C naught gate and then so on and you get a long sequence of pieced together pulses um, but if using some of these optimal control methods, you can actually synthesize a single pulse for a multi-qubit gate like this. And this isn't yet practical for many systems because, because of issues with calibration, but this is another interesting thing to keep in mind um, as we aren't just necessarily optimizing gates directly. Okay, so another method of... Um, Optimization is gate commutation. So this is where we um, use um, linear algebra properties and identities to switch the order of gates and move them around to with the goal of canceling them. So I'm going to list a few identities just to give you an idea. Um, but this is not in any way um, comprehensive. So we know that um, the poly matrices um, z and x where um, if you have two z's and you swap the order you still have two z's but if you have an x times a z um, poly matrix and you switch the order that's equal to negative x times z and so this um, informs some of these identities so for the single qubit case um, x and z swapped is just zx um, the minus sign becomes a global phase on the circuit and the global phase um, is physically irrelevant, so we can ignore it in terms of circuit optimizations. Um, and so for this identity, you have a Z and a C naught, and the control of the C naught is in the Z basis, so a Z and a Z can switch without any effect, without any phase, and so you can just switch them with no additional gates. However, the Z and the X here, you switch them and get an extra phase, and that extra phase gets kicked back to the control, which is an extra Z gate. So this identity um, is handy for moving a Z gate across a C naught or a C naught across a Z gate. Um, you have the same thing for X, but reversed, where an X across a Z generates a kickback of an X because this is an X here, but an X with an X, um, because they are the same, just swap without any additional gates. And this gets more interesting if you have um, two controlled gates. Um, so controls are both in the Z basis, so they can switch without any um, change just easily. However, um, a Z and an X here, if they switch, you get an extra phase. But they only get that extra phase if both of these controls are one, because only the Z and the X matter to switch if both the controls are one. So that extra phase turns into a control Z gate because that's the only case where that phase occurs. Um, and then this ex can extend to Toffoli gates as well as, as many controls as you want and you end up with phase only in the case of this three controlled Z gate. Um, that gives you an idea of some of these control um, identities for commutation. Um, there's a lot more of this um, 
that you can explore. Um, one method that I really like for um, finding, discovering some of the new, new identities or playing with this is a tool called Quark. Um, just a little web-based tool you can go to online. Um, and um, a trick to use this um, circuit simulator is to um, place these gates on the left-hand side and then put the right-hand side of your identity here, the left-hand side of your identity, the inverse of it here, and then if this output matrix here is the identity matrix, then um, this identity is true. If it's not, then there's something wrong with the identity. And you can like move gates around um, in real time and see and play around with it and see if um, you find any new identities. Um, and this is really useful um, for all sorts of circuit optimization stuff. Okay, so a third method that I'll talk about today is pattern matching. Um, this is a bit of an older method um, that I don't see used a lot in compilers these days, um, except for small, um, simple applications of it for um, few gates. But it's still very useful to know about. Um, so here's a couple examples of patterns. So you should all know this one, two C not gates in a row cancel out and are equivalent to the empty circuit. So this is a very basic pattern. Um, two, this is a swap gate. This is another way of doing a swap gate and they're equivalent. Um, so if you build up many of these patterns, um, you can basically encode all of the properties of or many of the properties of linear algebra you care about when rearranging and simplifying circuits. And because this is just equivalent to matrix multiplication of C naughts, um, then you can rearrange this equation to get this other equation to show that if you ever see a sequence of five C naughts in a circuit like this, it's equivalent to the single C naught, and you can just replace it and get a savings of four C naughts. Um, and you can have bigger pa um, patterns um, like this where a zigzag of these CNOT gates is actually equivalent to this CNOT gate. Um, while this may not be obvious, um, a lot of these may not be obvious just from a glance, um, and you have to derive them. So if you have a whole library of these patterns, um, you can basically do find replace um, on your whole circuit, and then at each instance you find, you can decide, should I replace it or not replace it, depending on um, if you think it will help you make form other replacements and reduce gates or not. Um, and then it becomes a search problem of which things you should replace where. Um, and once you've solved that search problem, um, you have an optimized circuit. All right, a final method I'll talk about is the ZX calculus. Um, this is a bit newer. So the ZX calculus um, is a calculus that is related to um, quantum circuits. Um, so you, you can have a quantum circuit such as this example here, and it's equivalent to um, this graph in ZX calculus. So you can see that each of these C naughts here corresponds to a red and green circle here with a vertical line between it, and each qubit corresponds to horizontal lines here. And this is a, um, a graph, so red and green nodes with lines um, connecting certain nodes and angles associated with some of those nodes. So this representation is actually much simpler than a quantum circuit because you only have two types of nodes with on one angle associated with them. And um, you can convert any quantum gates or quantum circuit into this representation. Um, and this is handy because the simplicity of the ZX calculus means that the um, rules for optimization and, sub and um, transforming this can be um, represented as a simpler set of core rules. And you can actually prove things about optimizing this into the minimal number of nodes. Um, so we can do that. And uh, if we ask this library here to do that, um, it will give us this um, representation. And you notice that this no longer looks like a quantum circuit. It has a whole bunch of diagonal lines and we don't know what those mean in terms of a circuit. But it does have fewer nodes in it. 
um, and so it looks like it may have optimized something. Um, but we have to turn it back into a circuit representation um, because the ZX calculus can actually represent more than physically realizable circuits. So we have to add some nodes back in to make it in a physically realizable circuit. And there's ways to do that, although I believe um, they might not be necessarily optimal. Um, so there's still some work to be done there. Um, but once you get it back into this form with horizontal and vertical lines only, then you can convert it back to a Quiskit circuit to go run on um, some hardware. And you can see that this circuit is completely different, completely rearranged from the original circuit because we totally um, rearranged the whole circuit globally. Okay, so in summary, we saw a bunch of ways to um, simplify circuits once you've decomposed them um, into single qubit and CNOT gates. Um, so we took the sub-circuit blocks and used some computationally expensive methods um, to find fewer gates for those blocks. Um, but we couldn't do larger blocks because that would take too long to compile, potentially. Um, we did some whole circuit transformations, um, like gate commutation and pattern matching, because they're a bit more efficient. Um, and then with the ZX calculus, we transformed it to an alternate representation that can represent more than the circuit circuit representation, and that makes it easier to optimize because you aren't restricted to stay in the circuit um, circuit representation as you manipulate the circuit. But then you have the challenge of bringing it back. Um, so there's a lot of open problems in this area of optimization. Um, so block synthesis of grades in two qubits, um, it's very hard and we don't know how to um, synthesize into the fewest number of gates, even CNOT gates or other types of gates. Um, another is we, a lot of these methods are optimizing after we've fully decomposed the entire circuit into one or two qubit gates, um, but it might be useful to do some of these optimizations before we've decomposed some of the gates, such as Toffoli's, um, where we have a little bit um, of a smaller, higher level representation of the circuit, and it might be easier to represent some of these pattern matching or commutation relations before we decompose into, like such Toffoli's into CNOT gates and other gates. Um, and finally, um, many methods that exist currently um, assume CNOT gates as the primitive gate, um, but this isn't necessarily true depending on what hardware you're targeting. Um, and there's um, a lack of many methods that um, natively target other gates. So if you try, so if you have hardware with other gates, then you may have to incur an overhead to convert CNOT gates to ISOP gates, for example. Okay, so um, with these past several lectures, we're done focusing on ideal circuit level compilation. And in the next several lectures, we'll um, introduce more of the device aware compilation steps um, that consider things like qubit position on a chip um, and, and the precise relative timing of gate execution, how that affects um, error rate and success rate of circuits.